All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, serving information entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and around the world. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I'm super excited to bring you our guest today, Peter Sandine. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I well, this conversation is overdue. I think we were just chatting about how we had connected early on, midway through the pandemic. It's been at least a year. And um, I know with international schedules, it's taken us a little bit, but I've been looking forward to this conversation. For folks that don't know Peter, Peter Sandine is often called the marketer's marketer because more than half of his clients are other marketing experts. They come to him to find out what is exact what it is exactly that motivates people to buy from them and to get clarity to what impacts their results the most. Peter's approach is based on a decade of conversion optimization, looking at what improves your marketing results most consistently. This is a super important topic, Peter. We were just talking. I agree, surprisingly. (laughs) Yes, but it really, truly, I feel like, you know, especially the optimization part, I feel like people really get lost in the weeds and like don't do it the right way, don't know where to look, are just attempting things. But really, you know, a lot of people don't know how to measure results. Yeah, or even if they measure results, it's a whole other thing to act based on them in yeah. a logical way. Yeah, mm. There's for many reasons, not just because it's difficult and, and like, do you know all the things, but it's also emotionally mm. sometimes difficult to make the, the like smart choices instead mm. of just like, I mean, the exaggerated example is like, do you just tweak what you're doing, even though it hasn't worked? if there's a reason to do it, or do you try another silver bullet when someone offers a a new online course or whatever on like this perfect system that if you just build it, it's going to work for you, but Mm -hmm. you've probably tried it a few times before and it hasn't worked. So like, but it can still feel much somehow safer and easier uh, than, than some sort of optimization of what you're doing. Mm. Talk to me a little bit about that emotional attachment concept and how you see it play out. Oh, so many ways. Um, But I I think the like big part is that uh, when people haven't gone through the process of building a business or building a new marketing system that actually ends up working, if they haven't done it any times or multiple times, they don't see how little tweaks can ultimately be the thing that makes it work. Because it's very much like a chain. If there's one broken link, it's just not going to function as a chain. A lot of marketing things are like that. Not all, but many Mm. are that there might be just one broken link. And because of that, you're not seeing almost any results, perhaps just a little bit of result here and there, but it might be just one little thing that's missing. But if you haven't gone through that, it can feel sort of impossible that it it, surely it isn't just one thing that I need to be like fix but I've mm-hmm. built this whole system. I'm not getting any results. So the, the like natural assumption is that surely all of it is broken that mm. or all of it is not good enough, that I need to build something different. Um, I've many times talked about how like it's, it doesn't make sense to like go for the best tactics or build the most effective sales funnel because the best tactic on on what scale like it's it's it might be a great tactic for someone in a sort of similar situation but what if it isn't quite the same situation Mm -hmm. or what if it that tactic or tool does something that you already have a way of doing it's very common for people to have a dozen different ways to reach new potential customers then a couple of ways to ultimately close sales but basically nothing in between there's almost nothing that would take the new potential customers to the point where they're comfortable with the sales conversation or ready to actually buy so that the sales conversation would make sense. Um, and then they see there's yet another way to reach new clients or to close new sales. And, and there's often these gaps that can be actually very big because uh, mm. it's, I'd say that maybe one or maybe let's say 5% of the marketing, the whole system or the path is sort of the lead generation. And then another maybe 5% 
is the closing the sale. You still have 90% in between. And it, it does, isn't usually perceived as such. So yeah. it's, people That's... might end up with a ton of things uh, at the top of the funnel as a way to reach mm. out, but very little that works at least after that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it takes a lot of skill to be able to do it. And even if you are able to do it, it still takes a lot of determination and sort of faith in the system, faith in the process uh, yes. to, to go with it. And although I don't gamble, like I, I mentioned before we started that I never gamble, but I still like to use some gambling analogies because it's such a good example of it that like mm. the best poker players do not, or let's say any poker player doesn't assume that they will win every single hand because that's a completely ridiculous idea. Rather, if you want to be good at it, you need to be able to look at, well, what do I need to do consistently to win most of the time and ultimately get positive results? And that's really how you'll need to look at business as well and marketing. Mm. You can't expect everything to work all the time perfectly on the first try. <laughs> that's just right. not how it goes. But rather, once you get some, some data, some sort of result, good or bad, you can... Again, it's not necessarily easy, but you can make an analysis of what is most likely the best next step to take mm -hmm. and then take that. Mm, no, I like that analogy. I'm still thinking about this gap that you've described essentially in the customer journey, right? People mm -hmm. having some initial tactic or strategy that gets people to connect with them, but then falling down along all those midpoints where you nurture that client or, you know, use language or your website or email marketing or whatever it is to get them over here to this end point where you're actually having an enrollment conversation with them. What is it that you think makes that so challenging for people to get that big middle part, right? Um, I think most people have never even heard what needs to happen in that middle part. Mm -hmm. Most people have never been told this is what actually needs to happen there. And it's very abstract. I'm happy to talk through it, but like, it's mm -hmm. just not something that you hear on any marketing webinar or just about any marketing course out there. Uh, I think I've heard maybe two people ever talk it out. And mm. those have been in private conversations, mm. not publicly. I don't know if it's just because it's too abstract for most people or mm. they think that it's too abstract to explain, but I don't think so. Um, but also it, it's, it's difficult to do. So it's, it's much easier to sell people the idea of like reach a million new people <laughs> or get this many new people on your email list. It's right. much more difficult to sell the idea that, well, there's going to be a ton of thinking involved to think through all the things you need to think through to do that 90% in between. Uh, it's also when you do your own thing, uh, it's like when you're selling it, it's so, so obvious what is the value of it, who should buy it, why it's better than other options. All those things are so obvious to you that it's I would argue maybe the most difficult thing to do in business, no matter how much expertise you have. I mean, I do messaging as the first thing in basically every client project. That's why experts come to me because even if they're messaging experts, it's that difficult to do for yourself. Yes. But when you are so close to it, it's easy to think that, well, if this sort of a person comes here, then I just need to tell them I do this thing and give them a free way to like schedule a time to talk with me. And surely someone who needs this thing will be happy to do it. But as your calendar will probably show, that's not how it works. <laughs> so mm. it's just very difficult to see what are the problems in your own thing, because yes. you're always so close to it. Right. Yeah. It, the perspective is just not there, I think, for so many. Um, I'm curious, because obviously so much of what your work involves is finessing language, right? And creating language that connects in the right way. Where did your interest in or skills in language start? Where did they start? Hmm, yeah. Interesting. So like, first did of you, all, I'm, did you have I'm, a I'm point not a native English life? speaker. <laughs> right, so that's right. one thing. Um, but I, I think when pe that comes up, people might wonder, well, how did I become a copywriter? I started out as a copywriter. That's not my main thing anymore. But yeah. um, I'd say it's not really as much about the exact words. It is mm. about the thoughts you're saying. So mm. it's the, the classic example is why do most headline tests fail to create any difference in results? 
because people just say the same thing in two different ways. As long as you're making people think the same thing in two different ways, it's very unlikely there's much of a difference in the results. Right. So you're you saying say two the... completely different things, you get two completely different results. At least mm. you're much more likely to get that. So it's it's really much more about catching the thought or the feeling you need to get people to see rather than do yeah. you use the perfect word for it? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that's one thing people don't need to worry so much about. Well, is it this word or this synonym synonym for it that mm -hmm. kind of has a better feeling to it? Like, yeah, you can think about it, but don't stress about it. Like that's not going to make or break anything. No, I love ever. I love this. What you're saying is spend more time getting the underlying concept right. Yes. Yeah. So how do you Definitely. help people with that? Sorry? How do you help people with that? Uh, I dig it out of them. <laughs> so yeah. It's a ton of questions. Uh, I'm happy to give the big picture view, though, because there's a couple of things people often do wrong, even though they're basically thinking of the right things. The first is the target customer. And everyone always starts with the target customer, which is good. However, the problem is that people are usually thinking of how do we see the target customer? How would we mm. pick them out of a crowd? How would we target ads for them? So what would we tell Facebook as the description of whom mm. we want to show our ads to? So it's very important. I'm not saying at all that, but it doesn't make any difference when we're trying to think of what we should say to them because how we see them makes no impact on their decision. Whereas mm. how they see what we do is all that matters. So when I start to look at a client's situation, I, I mean, obviously I want to know that like, how we do we see them? <laughs> but then the more important thing actually is narrowing it still down to just the people who have a similar viewpoint to what we're offering them. Because mm -hmm. as a rough example, if one person is super worried about, let's say how long something's gonna take and another person doesn't care at all about that, but it's just super worried about can this thing work for someone like them for let's say they're because of their age or whatever it's a completely different situation we need to say completely different things in marketing for those people mm. so for marketing to be effective we have to narrow down to one fairly uniform fairly homogeneous uh, viewpoint of course we can have multiple target customers but that complicates things but that's that's the first thing so the target customer is not really about well what size business are they or mm. are they women or men or do they have children or not unless that is really the thing that defines how they view the topic yeah. and that's that's the first sort of like why it's so difficult <laughs> because people no, don't have I the love very basic that yes and it sounds like it's also so much about how your target customer views themselves right yeah related to what you do yes, yes. Yeah. So if, I mean, a rough example, you, you help people with the legal side of business. I'm in Finland. My view to the legal side of things is vastly different from anyone who's in the US because right. the legal system is completely different. I don't need to worry about what is the literal way this has been put into the law. It's like, well, how would a reasonable person interpret this? That's how the law works. <laughs> so like the, the worries are completely different. I would be worried about the like, well, what if someone is in America and like, how do I avoid that jurisdiction? And so like, <laughs> the, the viewpoint is so different that you would have to talk to me as a potential client entirely differently, even though I would still be a valid potential client. Right. Um, but yeah, that's just the first of these three main issues or let's say four the second one is how do we describe the benefits and the, the classic example or the classic instruction is that we'll tell them about all the benefits all the great uh, good outcomes they will get every good copywriting course will tell you to do that so clearly it's not bad advice it's just easy to mess up um, because if you try to tell people about all the great things, it becomes messy. You start to sound like a stereotypical used car salesman. The problem is that if, if I say that, well, or imagine you go to, a, uh, I'm, you go to my used car uh, store and you point to a car and like, well, what is this car like? 
And I say that, well, it's really high fuel efficiency and ecological, and it's very safe, and it's good for family trips and long trips and for long trips and short trips and in the city and in the highway. And it's really good, cool looking and long lasting and great value for the price. And it has great stereo and great brakes and great airbags. And you don't probably remember any of that anymore because I'm saying way too many things. I'm basically claiming that it's great in every single way. Whereas, and then if you point to another car and I say the same thing about that, like it becomes completely meaningless. Whereas imagine that for you, the most important things about a car would be that it's safe, family-friendly and ecological. Like, let's just say those would be your most important things, the ones that affect your decision most. And you'd point to a car and say, what is this like? And I say, well, that's a really good family car. It has amazing like uh, ecological stuff and it's like the best safety features. Uh, do you want to hear more about this or some other different kind of car? Now you think that this is your car. <laughs> I, I did that with like 10 words. Right. Obviously you don't necessarily buy it, but it's damn hard for me or anyone else to sell anything else anymore because you heard exactly what, what matters most to you. Right. And it's the same thing with the benefits overall. There is a way to be, like to bring in all the other ones. So if I want to hype up the, the brakes, then instead of just saying that, well, it has also great brakes, I'd say it has great brakes, which is one of the reasons it's the safest car in its class. Mm -hmm. It also has one of the best uh, airbag systems, which again, makes it even safer. And it has these USB chargers, which if you're out with your kids in a longer road trip, yada, 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 like mm -hmm. all those benefits and outcomes are built around the few key things that matter the most, and then it becomes effective. So I can say basically all the same things, but how I'm structuring it takes it from sort of a meaningless sales pitch that no one really takes mm -hmm. seriously. Yeah. It's not that you think I'm lying. Like that's not the thought, oh, this person must be lying. <laughs> it's just that okay like that that's the like okay cool apparently it's a good car right but it's, that, it's that, positioned very differently it's like the difference in my mind between just being presented with a long list where you're left deciphering like how do these things all fit together what does this mean versus given like the three signposts right it's this this and this and then kind of centering everything else around those yeah exactly then the next issue comes with the differentiation. Everyone knows they need to tell people what differentiates them. Yes, that's true. Uh, but the, the, let's say the part that is often overlooked is, again, understanding the perspective of the person you're trying mm -hmm. to talk to. They don't necessarily know of all the same competitors that you know of. And they don't usually even think of competitors. What they think of is alternatives. So yes, your competitors are alternatives, but there are usually very different kinds of alternatives. So uh, a simple example I always use is that if you're a therapist, you're not just competing against other therapists, you're competing against people's friends or mm -hmm. bars. Both basically solutions in some people's minds to the same problems that you as a therapist can solve not necessarily very good solutions. Mm -hmm. Most friends are not able to give the same kind of perspective and outside uh, guidance or outside like perspective to your problems as a good therapist would. Uh, but that is still an alternative solution to a lot of the same things you do provide, which is like comfort, getting to talk through your problems and so on. So first you need to understand, well, what are you actually compared to? Not just the competitors, your target customers might never have heard of any single one of your competitors. Mm -hmm. So what do they compare you to? Then how do they see those alternatives? It doesn't matter if you know that some solution is, is completely pointless. Like, mm -hmm. well, if you buy this product, it's going to break within two months. Like everyone in the industry knows that, right? But clearly not if people keep buying it. <laughs> like I, I almost worked with a company that produces hospital beds, certain kinds of hospital beds. Uh, or no, some sort of medical beds anyway, mm -hmm. they know that people who buy those beds typically buy two, even if they need one, because they break so often that they're going to be, they need two because one will always be getting fixed. And this company rather sells very high quality ones. So that's something that even the buyers would understand as, okay, this can be different. However, will they believe it? If the 
if the, the biggest name in the business creates products that break that easily, will, how easily will they believe that this little company from somewhere else can produce the same product that doesn't break all the time? So just because people could see something as different, it's like, well, will they believe that it is different? And also, do they care? So there's a lot of things that you know are significant differences. I'm sure that the way you help people with legal stuff, you know a ton of things about how you do it that are significant and probably rather unusual, but can your potential future clients appreciate it? A lot of those things, no, because they're not the experts and they've never been burned by those specific issues. <laughs> so you need to really narrow down to just the things that people understand very easily, believe they're real and see as significant for them. So when you're talking with people about alternatives, how are you recommending that they approach that? Just narrow, is it again, narrowing down the focus of what they're talking about? Um, well, usually I, I look at it as, well, what are the things that you are most often compared to? Part mm. of it is that if you've been in business for a while, you probably have a pretty good sense of what people point out as the alternatives. If you sell any sort of software, then you're probably compared to some 15-year-old Excel sheet that is used in the companies. Right. <laughs> it's like one misclick away from destroying decades of data. But so it's a completely like ridiculously bad solution but it kind of works. So, right. so it's just about knowing then what options your people are looking at as alternatives yeah. in the marketplace. Yeah. If you don't know, then you need to find out. And there's obviously many mm -hmm. different ways of doing it, depending on what sort of business you're in, how many mm -hmm. clients you have and all that. But yeah, you need to figure out what it is that you're compared to. Then what do they see? Like, how do they see those alternatives, whether mm -hmm. those are correct or incorrect beliefs? Right. It, it doesn't matter. And then only then you can start to look at, well, what would be different about you mm. from their perspective? And yeah, some people can like you can basically build around fake differences. So a, a classic example was uh, Schlitz Beer, an American uh, company that I don't remember when some decades ago had lost a lot of market share mm. and they hired a, a one of the greatest uh, copywriters ever and he came to the manufacturing plants and looked at one big thing and was like what is this like I like beer and I have no idea what this is and the manufacturing I don't know was it the company owner or someone anyway they said like ah, never mind it just purifies the water like it, that's how the process works in every company and the guy just wouldn't let up and, and the eventually he built the entire advertising campaign around the purity of slitch beer there was nothing special about how pure the beer was. All the companies did the same exact stuff, but they just because no one knew. Right. <laughs> Therefore, they were able to build around it. I don't recommend that because it's <laughs> usually too easy uh, for other companies to catch up. Yeah. On the other hand, if you don't have big companies as your competitors, then you don't usually have to worry about it so much. Mm. But anyway, the key is, what can make people see you as different in a way they actually care about? Preferably well, things that are actually different. That are actually relevant. Yeah. But it is an interesting question to think about what is it that somebody wouldn't know about my service or the way I do things or my product that's relevant, right? Mm -hmm. That that should be highlighted. And I think that takes kind of getting out of our own skin and looking at it, you know, from alternative perspectives. Yeah. And it's really hard. As I said, mm. this is, I would argue, the most difficult thing to do in business mm. for your own business. This is probably the hardest thing you will do into your entire business career. That's why it might make sense to get some help with it, mine or somebody else's. But right. it is difficult to see your own thing from another person's perspective. If you have friends who are really good at it, great. Uh, but a lot of people think that, well, I'll just ask my clients and it can be helpful, but people, I mean, as a race, human race, we are just very bad at understanding our own decisions on that level. And we're also not very good at telling the truth when we do understand. <laughs> so there's a very low chance that people truly understand why they chose you. Mm -hmm. uh, they might, but most people don't, and they will come up with some excuses that they might even believe are true. Right, that they justify but even if afterwards. If you recognize the real reasons, most people will not tell. 
I mean, mm. why do I buy a fancy iPhone? When I f- bought the first one, I excused it by saying that, well, it syncs the calendar really well with my Mac. Mm. But did I really spend several hundred euros extra on an iPhone compared to what I had previously just for the calendar to sync slightly more consistently? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> And, and really, I mean, I've used this example for years now, so I've had time to think of, well, what were the real reasons? And I probably still don't want to say, because I'm embarrassed about the actual reasons. So, like, <laughs> it, it is very unusual. And, I mean, some extreme examples of it would be, like, if you're selling to companies, but not for the owner of the business, it mm-hmm. is quite common that one of the key motivators for people is that they think they will look smart in the eyes of their mm-hmm. superiors. Are they mm. going to say, when you ask, why did you buy this? Right. Because I think that wh- how you do this will make me look really smart. <laughs> this was way more expensive and, and all that. I mean, no. That's so, such a good example. Yes. Well, and isn't that the truth? I mean, th- I, I think any of us can think back on any number of decisions. Who was I talking with the other day, right? But we were reflecting on the fact that all decisions are made by the limbic brain, not the neocortex, right? It's like an emotion that you feel that is either like a yes or a no in regards to a decision. It's only later that your neocortex catches up and creates all the reasons why, right? And this is exactly, I think what you're saying is like, that is absolutely how we make decisions. It's like a gut instinct or a feeling. We make the decision and then our, you know, neocortex gets busy creating the list of why this was a good decision. We're just justifying it after the fact. Yeah, yeah. The, the classic copywriters like uh, motto is that people buy based on feelings and justify it with, with their yeah. like, thoughts. So, or logic is only a justification method. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be a misleading like idea. It is true, but it can be mm-hmm. misleading. So it's not that if you're selling, I don't know, let's say some manufacturing parts it's not like you wouldn't need to also point out the logical benefits like i'm not right. saying that right uh, people take it too far often and think yes. that well i'm supposed to make i don't know sell screws as if it was a uh, perfume like yeah. you know, <laughs> like that's not the point <laughs> i can see why it would sound like it but no uh, but, but if you're eating. selling screws, somebody might have a feeling about you and how they feel about interacting with you when, you know, they're about to make that decision versus this other supplier or this other store or yeah. whatever. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And a lot of that feeling can be created with logical things. Right? Mm. Now we're getting pretty deep into this, <laughs> but like you could, for example, let's say that one of the reasons to buy from you, uh, like one of the most impactful things people could know about you is that um, you guarantee that, I don't know how this works in manufacturing screws, but let's say you would guarantee that if there are faulty screws, you will like pay it back to the person who bought it or like, I don't know, you may somehow make up for it. So you're overall trying to build this very reliable, trustworthy Mm -hmm. image. So the feeling you're building is that like comfortable and and, and the low risk and all that. Mm -hmm. So the reason people buy from you is not that they might be uh, like reimbursed for some minor inconvenience, but rather the feeling that they Mm. will be taken care of, even in such small ways. And if you take care of even such small things, then you surely take care of also much bigger things. Like if you're late with a shipment, you will pay them like, or lower Mm. the cost until it's delivered all the way to you actually paying them while delivering the stuff. Like, It, it's you should build something that is a coherent feeling. So it wouldn't yes. make sense to just be paying for the faulty products if you wouldn't otherwise also have something similar around it. Yeah. But yes, the, no, the I, connection I between that. the logic and the feelings gets rather complex. But, mm-hmm. but yes, ultimately it's the feeling that you have to create, but a lot of mm-hmm. it can be created with logical things. Right, this information that helps them actually feel better about that decision. Yeah. Yeah, and trust the feeling. Mm Because that's another thing. You can't feel safe with a company or a person unless you trust that what they're saying is true. And that trust might need to be built with very logical things in some Mm. cases. Not always, but sometimes it does. Mm. No, I love that. 
So at what point in your career did you start recognizing and, and become the marketer's marketer, right? Where you had other people in marketing coming to you for help? Actually, very, very early, which really? is kind of funny, but that's because of the very first successful offer I made. Mm. So I started out as a copywriter. And the first thing that really started work, working well was that I contacted other marketing experts who already had good sales pages. Mm -hmm. I would say that I can write an even better one for no money at all. <clears throat> You'll A-B test yours, the current one you have against mine. And based on the results, if I beat yours, then I get paid a portion of what you make additional money. So you have nothing to lose and a lot to gain. And I won all but one of those tests, which was a oh. tie. I didn't do it for very long, uh, mm. not that many times, but anyway, that's when it started. And then I very soon got into conversion optimization because I wanted to see what else affects website results. And mm. it started out as just website stuff. I just wanted to see the website. But very quickly, I noticed that, well, the messaging, the, what do you talk about? Not mm. what tactic do you use or where you put a button, <laughs> like all right. those things can make a big difference, but usually they don't. Whereas what you talk about or who you're talking to, how you mm. narrow it down or what you offer them, those are really the foundation. The mm. Who do you talk to? What are you offering them? And how do you describe it? Or what do you say about it? Mm -hmm. Those are the impactful things. And as I said, that's really hard to do, even if you're an expert and experts know that. So they very often look for help with it. And since I had all these clients I had done copywriting for, mm. it's just sort of snowballed from there. And although I've never done any marketing for marketing experts specifically since then, it's still the case that they, they are the most common client for me. Yeah. But it's also because the, as soon as I, I got outside of the just website conversion optimization and looking at the bigger picture optimization, that's also something most people, even in marketing, aren't even trying to be very good at. They're tacticians. Mm. They might be brilliant at running Facebook ads, or they might be brilliant at running a specific strategy, but are they good at analyzing a ton of data? Are they good at not only analyzing the data, but finding the bottlenecks and then figuring out, well, often just estimating which one has the highest potential compared to the risks it has, the costs it has to actually solve it compared to how much, like how much you know about it. And like, I mean, there's a bunch of things you have to more or less calculate to get to the, well, you should be doing on this thing in this way to have the best chance of seeing a positive result. And also a lot of people even people who are good at it don't like doing it for themselves. Yes. So even if they basically could, it's still hard to find that time to do your own business. It's right. very easy to be like, well, I have this deadline for a client. I will not miss it, mm -hmm. but uh, I can think about my own business next week. Yeah. The working so on the business versus that, in... Yeah. Just having yeah. the like consistency of talking with someone weekly. And like, even if you haven't done anything, things have still happened. And we can mm -hmm. again, look at, well, what should you work on? Is the same plan that was the best yet last week, mm -hmm. still the best plan probably mm -hmm. is, but maybe not. Yeah. And also if it wasn't easy to get to it, then why wasn't it? What do we change so that it's easier for you to do the work? Do we need to change the, instead of you making a video, you write a post or instead of doing a video in this specific way, how, what if you would do it in this completely other way? I just mm. had a client who really struggled to make a video promoting uh, an offer he made, whereas he's really good at making uh, videos while just walking out with his dogs and talking about exactly the same topic, but just the setting and how the video is framed completely changes it. So if he's trying to sell, a, let's say, an online course about X, that's really hard. But if he's just talking about what sort of a course should be or what would make a course about X good while talk, uh, walking his dogs, that's easy. So like just finding all those things for yourself is really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think point is marketing experts recognize the value of yeah. what they do for others, but they also see how difficult it is to do for themselves and yeah. they like referring people. So yep. Yeah, that's so great. I, so are you saying that you will help people then look at the whole picture? Like you said, you moved on from just website optimization to looking at other marketing assets, how they're launched into the world, how they work together. I assume that includes 
email marketing efforts, online, other online platforms that they're using to run their ads. Yeah. 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 I'm not an ex. I'm not the, the world's leading expert on any one of those, uh, but I know almost all of the major uh, tactics well enough to be able to analyze them and well mm-hmm. enough to know if it makes sense to try it. Mm-hmm. And if it makes sense to try it, then what is the first way we probably should try it? Yeah. But once we see good results, um, let's say a client starts with Facebook ads, uh, and we start to see, okay, this is working we are starting to see profit or at least we're breaking even with very, very little time and very little money put into it, then, okay, great. Now let's hire someone who will do nothing but Facebook ads eight hours a day for years. Like surely they know more about the algorithm than I will ever. But Mm. it's Dove Gordon, someone we both know, uh, had this brilliant analogy. I don't think he uses it anymore, but he talked about marketing plumbers. The idea is that if you go to a plumber and say, can you build me a house? They're going to look at you like you're an idiot. And like, no, I cannot build you a house. I can deal with the plumbing. That's what I'm good at. But if you go to a Facebook ad expert and say, can you build my marketing? 99% of them will be, yes, surely I can. Even though they can do Facebook ads. That's what they are good at. They might also know something about the landing pages or some other pieces Mm -hmm. and here and there, but it's very unlikely that a Facebook ad expert is really a great expert at the big picture. So I'm like the same way, I'm not the greatest expert in Facebook ads. I just can tell if it makes sense to try. And if yes, then how? Just so we see if it makes sense to dive deeper into it. So well, it's uh, such a great example. Look at the bigger picture rather than a single thing. Yeah. Well, well, people need help with the strategy. And I think too often they're jumping into, you know, it's like the hammer and nail analogy. You go to somebody who has a hammer and you know, you're going to be the nail, but in that specific thing that they do and only that, right. Unless you are dealing with somebody who's going to help you with the overall strategy and choose, do we need to use the hammer or do we really need a wrench or whatever? Right. (laughs) So it's an important point because I think people just end up making choices based on what they think they should be doing, what other people are doing. Right. But it may not make the most sense for their particular business. Yeah. And I think especially in the marketing business, a lot of people don't put a whole lot of value on what fits a person. So mm-hmm. even if it's some, if something would fit your business, is it something you feel comfortable doing? Is yeah. this way of doing it something you feel comfortable with? Like you wouldn't believe how many people have come to me saying that I have a webinar that converts, but I feel really bad about it. <laughs> like I just don't want to have a webinar out there that is so salesy and so like aggressively pushing people into a decision like it sells but like can I have something else (laughs) like yes like all those reasons why such a webinar works can be done in a way that isn't aggressive and isn't manipulative but it's still Mm. equally if not better more effective so right and in that example you probably have a bunch of people that built a webinar in such a way because somebody else told them this is how you build a webinar, right? Yeah, exactly. So they chose that tool, they did it, and then they, it didn't feel right. And I love your example of the guy on, on video, right? Like sitting maybe in an office like this mm-hmm. on Zoom or whatever, recording a video just feels wrong to him or not fun or not authentic, but out walking the dog and being in the moment is so much easier. That's such yeah. a great and powerful example that you know, people shouldn't throw out a certain strategy or marketing asset. They just maybe need to do it in a different way with a little help from somebody that can say, Hey, do it this way, not that way. Yeah. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's balancing act between like, how much time do you have? How much money you have? Mm -hmm. What experience do you have? Mm -hmm. What skills do you have? Like if, if you don't know anything about like the technology of all these online tools, then let's not build something super complex. Mm -hmm. If you've never built a, I don't know, if you've never built a sales funnel, then like it's the most ridiculous claim I've ever heard. Pardon to all those people who sell these things. But I I think it's complete BS when people say you need the most advanced sales funnel or you will be left behind. It's like, if you sell like, nutritional supplements maybe like that's just such an insanely competitive field then maybe okay 
the pop but up, like, the upsell, the downsell, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but like looking at some of the stuff that they they tell you to build, it's it you like if you talk with them, and I know a bunch of these people. Mm. Like if you ask them, well, how long does it take you to build your own funnel according to the same plan? Well, like six to nine months. It's like, okay, so did you do all of it yourself? Oh no, no, I outsourced the writing of all the videos, writing of all the emails, editing all the videos editing and setting up of all these pages. It's like, so you outsource 90% of the work and it still takes you, the expert, nine months to do this. Yeah. And then you say people can do this in what, three weeks? That doesn't sound quite right. Mm. So then it's the like 0.1% of people who actually even finish the, the whole thing. Yes. And even fewer of them get good results because results. once you build something that complex, there's a good chance something is broken. And when oh. it's that complex, it's extremely difficult to figure out what is broken and even if you do find it can you figure out why it's broken and if mm. you figure that out can you change it without <laughs> changing everything else <laughs> so it's like oh that just makes my heart hurt right for yeah. all the people that are like wanting to do it and do it well and just you know don't have an easy path from here to there yeah yeah and it's, it's like, I mean, if I would try to build that and I have built those sorts of things mm. many times, it would take me months yeah. you know, or at least weeks. If I spent nothing, if I did nothing else than that, right. it would take me multiple weeks of like right. 12 hour days. And I could not expect it to work great. And if it didn't work great, like it probably didn't, I could not expect to be able to figure out why. And I'm pretty mm. good at analyzing it. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So when mm. I show people like after I've like, Typically with a coaching client, I would plan them the marketing based on what has worked for them, what they're good at, what they like mm -hmm. doing and all that. And I would say, okay, so here it is. We have these things. The most common question is, so what else do I need to do? Because it, it doesn't need to be that complex. The, whole, yeah. the point isn't that we build something perfect immediately. The point is to get something done quickly that has a good chance of it working works. well. Yeah. And it probably works well. Usually it does work well mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, truly more importantly, it's something we can easily see how to improve. I love that. That like that's the consistency part. Like well, if you don't it... count on and if you don't build based on the fact that you assume to improve, you're really making things very low probability for yourself. Right. Well, and the way you describe that, that just feels so much more doable. Like one, mm -hmm. it's a system that will happen and get done and that you can start to measure. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. How, so how do you, so I'm glad you brought that up. Like how, where you typically start with your clients, share with us the ways that you work, how, who do you support? Who do you really love working with? And you know, what does your work typically look like for them? Okay. Um, well, most of my clients are other marketing experts, mm -hmm. but uh, the rest, the people I actually do marketing for are anything and everything. Uh, Got it. Like Wide everything range. else than that. The principles I mean, are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's anything from jewelers and e-commerce businesses mm -hmm. to industrial like manufacturing to therapists to consultancies to outsourcing businesses to medical device businesses to mm -hmm. like artists and architects and like really anything and everything um so i sh i mean i know i should narrow it down it would be easier <laughs> but i really enjoy having a huge variety of very different kinds of businesses mm. because that's how i get better at what i do that i get to look at instead of sort of seeing that well i can just do the same thing i did with the previous client it mm. forces me to look at well this case what makes sense in this case what is mm. best in this case and that's, I think, what I enjoy most uh, in, in this. Yeah, but I love how that. I work, the most common option, if people don't just want to do a quick project, uh, mm -hmm. is weekly coaching. And we start by going through the target customer perspective, figuring out what are the motivating benefits, mm -hmm. what are the differentiators. I create them, the what I call the core value message that mm -hmm. gathers those really most important things together that then guides everything else. Then I also plan them the what I call the conversion path. So what are all the path, like all the blocks mm -hmm. on the path, what are all the steps from the first contact to the sale? Um, that's based on what they have done, what they want to do, what they don't want to do, mm -hmm. what has worked for them, what hasn't worked and, and all that. And I give them instructions for all of this. And then every week we go through what they have done. And once it's built, usually this, I mean, they have usually 
all of it done within about two months into the uh, work. And then we start looking at, well, how is it working? What should you do next? Whether within that one conversion path or in business otherwise. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not a systems expert or outsourcing expert. I mean, I've been doing this for a decade, so I've seen a lot of these things. <laughs> I can often refer to someone, but like usually, let's be honest, we'll talk about marketing and sales. Um, but within that realm, what is it mm. that you should be doing next and mm. how? And then just about always I can give the instructions so that you know what to do until next week. And then we have another call. So like I, I was actually just talking today with someone who asked about the, the same question, like how do I work with people? And I pointed out, or why do I work this way? And I pointed out that I had a lot of hobbies as a kid and I had a teacher or a coach in each one. Yeah. Whether it was individual thing, like I played classical guitar or it was a sport, like mm -hmm. uh, table tennis or, or soccer, there was someone to tell me what to do and how to do it, look at what I do and tell me how I do it wrong and how to fix it, what exercises I need to do and so on. Mm -hmm. And then the next week, the same thing again. Again, I would show, well, this is what I did. Here are my questions. Now I'm doing it like this. What should I do next? And how do I do that? And then I would be on my merry way for the next week. And the, the results, as long as I did my part, were very, very good. Mm. And I think that's not missing from business. There's plenty of people who try to do that. But again, most of them are tacticians. So they look at that, their expertise. And again, nothing wrong with that. If you're the best person in Facebook ads, great. Like, let me hire you and hire you for my clients. Like, nothing wrong with it. But it is a different expertise to mm -hmm. look at the big picture or to really hone into that one tactic or one thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's the whole point, looking at yep. what it is that you should do, how to do it, and make sure that you feel comfortable with what you need to do. Because I think... The greatest reason, in my experience, for why people procrastinate uh, in business is that they, they, two reasons. One is that they don't really know how to do something. Mm -hmm. So the instructions they have are too confusing. They, are, they have very often conflicting instructions from multiple sources, or they don't feel actually comfortable with doing it the way that they feel like they should do it. Like yeah. a lot of people think that they should do email marketing so that they send an email every day. Mm -hmm. It's like, nope. I mean, it can work in many mm -hmm. cases, it can work, but like, I don't do it. It certainly could work for me, but like, I don't want to do it that way. Yeah. I yeah. like sending one really good email every week that people actually mm -hmm. enjoy getting instead of sending five pitches a week. I think that's, right. that's just not something I would want to do. Could I make a bit more sales like that? Maybe possible. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. it is possible. But it's not at all like there's multiple ways of doing things. Yes. So then just Yep. If the instructions that we came across last week or even created for you last week didn't, you couldn't do it, then let's figure out why. Let's mm. not just think that, well, you suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's usually not that. It's not just that, well, you were busy. Okay. Were you really that busy or did yeah. you just want to prioritize something else than doing this thing that you feel really uncomfortable <clears throat> with? Well, and this is such an important point because actually David Wood, whose episode went live this morning, uh, we had a conversation about like any of us in life have limited time, limited attention, right? Limited energy. There's only so much that we can do. And sometimes if we have a priority that we're not getting to, and I think marketing and getting your language right, get, like doing this is really important and yet so many of us still fall down in actually getting it done the right way. We need a forcing mechanism, right? And this, like that consistency, that, that process that you go through and working with your clients on a weekly basis, I think is that forking me forcing mechanism, right? It shows people, it, it forces people to show up, have the conversation, you know, at least do the work while they're attending to the meeting or whatever, and then have a much better chance of prioritizing it than if they don't, it's like going to the gym, right? If you've got a coach or a trainer, like you're way more likely in many circumstances to actually make that happen on a consistent basis, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think just it's not about like uh, just looking at, well, why didn't you do something? 
Right? And, mm -hmm. and like, I think just taking away the idea that, well, you should have done it like this. Like, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is that, well, you didn't. Why is it? Can we change it? Yes. Like, I don't judge. Yes. I, I have plenty of that myself. Like, I don't do something even though I had intended to do it. Then I need to look at, well, why is it? Do I need to change it? And usually, yes, I need to change how I'm going to do it so that I feel good about it and actually do it. Um, well, and, and the, I think there's a really important point that most of us need help, especially with those things that feel a little outside of our comfort zone or whatever, to really look at it creatively in a different light from a different perspective. Right. And it's, it's not something that we can just power through. Like we literally just need some help. Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously this is a bit biased view because I do coaching, but like if my always use this example that like, if I would need to suddenly make money uh, as like become a professional singer mm -hmm. and make money with singing, I, I'm not a singer. I'm not an expert on it in any way. If I had to do that, if my like my and my family's financial future depended on my singing skills, the first thing I would do is hire a coach. Right. <laughs> like the very first thing. So it's like it's not like unless or let's put it this way, even if your thing that you sell forward, the thing that you're supposed to be the greatest expert at is mm. being able to look at business and analyze it, all that you should still hire a coach to help you do it for your yes. own stuff. But if that is not the thing you sell forward, then why should you be the expert at that? The like leading expert of that. Yeah, you need to learn some things. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I coach people, the goal is to teach them, not just, yeah. not just blindly give them like, do this, but yeah. explain why so that we can get to a slightly better of alternatives later on or get a little more advanced or get a little trickier once it feels comfortable because they've mm -hmm. gotten that much better at it. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, it's really taxing to do something every week that you don't understand and yes. just sort of blindly go through these motions mm -hmm. you don't really understand and, and like all the time struggle with it. But if you actually start to see that oh, when we did this thing, it worked like this and it created more sales mm -hmm. because of this and this. I see it now. I'm mm -hmm. like, you can, like, you can enjoy it much more because yes. you, you start to see how those things fit together. Yeah. But yeah, overall, like 90% of the time I tell people to do much less marketing stuff mm -hmm. and just focus on like one, two, maximum three different things mm -hmm. until the next call. Yeah. And like, what a relief, like please. just hearing that, right? What a relief. People are going, yes, please. I want to do less, <laughs> not more. <laughs> yeah, but mm. it's like a, an example, like an analogy I used as a little kid was like, how do you uh, peel a thousand potatoes? One at a time. Like you, you don't try to peel all of them at the same time somehow. Like you can't juggle them like that. It's completely ridiculous. You might have three different peeling knives, maybe if you had completely different kinds of potatoes and you might do three at a time. I don't know. But like the analogy was the 10 year old Peter's analogy, mm. but the point stands, you can't do very many things. And the more you switch between different things, the harder it gets to actually complete those things. And the yes. point is the sooner you complete things, even if overall, like, let's say you would have 52 projects in a year, and you can either complete one every week or you can complete all of them at the very end of the year. Which one is going to create better results? So if you complete one the first week, then you have 51 weeks to see the results from that. Right. You have 50 weeks to see the results from the second one and so on. Yeah. So the sooner you complete things, and I think in software you say like the sooner you ship it, so like yep. put it live, yep the better, just the sooner you start to see the results, the sooner it can affect your profit. Yeah. And that's really ultimately what it's about. Of course, there can be other values, like how mm. often, like how much you work, what sort of clients you have, what do you help them with? Like some people want to work with nonprofits or want to work only two hours every day, or they want to work only two days a week or like all these things affect as well, but ultimately you need to get things actually completed for them to make any difference in business yeah. most of the time. There are some Absolutely. exceptions, but mostly it's like that. So it's better to prioritize ruthlessly. And it can be much easier if someone else tells you that you don't need to worry about that. I know you're stressed about it, but nope, it, it's, mm. you don't need to worry about it. It's not the thing for this week. 
forget it. Yeah. It's fine. It's not right? going to get any worse. There's nothing going to, nothing's going to break. Just breathe and do this other thing. And here's how. Like, yeah. no. I mean, I'm exaggerating for comedic effect. I'm not quite that patronizing about it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point being that like people get really just tense about those things and mm. very scared to stop what they've started. Right. And also very scared. Like if someone has decided that, okay, they're going to now try this strategy and they will build this one thing that they, they saw someone do and until they're done, they won't look at anything else. Well, if someone can point out that, well, that cannot work for you because X, Y, and Z, they should be willing to be like, okay, so let's deal with X, Y, and Z first and then get back to it. But even that mm -hmm. can be tricky. Like it, it requires quite a bit of, I'm not sure what it requires, like just mm -hmm. comfortableness with like changing your plan and admitting to yourself that your initial plan wasn't perfect, just so that you can change what you're doing. So right. Well, and again, with the out, outside perspective on is this reasonable, right? Yeah. Like, because I think a lot of people, if they have not had the chance to look at many businesses, find out what results are good and which ones are less than good, they may not have the perspective in their own business to realize, like, oh, this is actually not an adequate result. I should change this right? Especially if it's trickling, if it's working a little bit, right? They might hang on to it like, oh, I just need to do it better or whatever. And it just may not be the path for them. But I think, again, that outside perspective of like, no, that's actually an unreasonable assumption or an unreasonable expectation. It's really important for us to be able to, you know, to get that kind of help. Um, yeah, but not to make this sound too much like a sales pitch for coaching. Mm -hmm. I think like, yes, coaching can help a lot. But mm -hmm. even if you don't hire anyone to help you, uh, just first of all, reducing the number of things you're working on mm -hmm. is usually a good idea. All the way down to one is usually a good idea. So basically, the sooner you can complete things, the better. Typically, yeah. there are some situations, obviously, you sometimes you have to work on multiple things. That's fine. But like the sooner you actually get things done, the better. Even if you're not doing them perfectly, it's still usually much better that you get it done sooner rather than tweak it so that it gets marginally better before you yeah. publish it six months later. <clears throat> um, well, your, your phrase, ruthlessly prioritize, right? Yeah. So important. It reminds me of a quote. I, I think I've seen it posted numerous times by John Asaroff that says, do less better to completion. Yeah. Right. So yeah. powerful and, and, it, and yet so challenging for so many of us to actually do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I've often talked about marketing essentialism. The idea mm. of like do fewer things, but do them well enough for them to actually work. And often it means doing them better, but mm -hmm. typically it means aiming to do them worse so that you get them done sooner. So <laughs> Progress over perfection. Yes. yes. Much rather, done is much better than perfect. Yes. So, so true. Oh, I yeah. love that. Um, well, Peter, for folks that are listening today, we're, and they're thinking, I need to go connect with Peter. I need to figure out how to hire him or how to learn from him. Where do you like to send people? Uh, my website, petersandin.com. Uh, Perfect. You should get a sense of what I do from there. If this wasn't enough of a lecture, <laughs> enough of a monologue. I, I like going on long tangents. Pardon me. Um, no, 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 no. It's so good because I think just hearing this from somebody who is an expert in the space. I mean, it does a couple things. One, I think it, it, it reminds me how complex it is to try to do everything ourselves, right? And also how a little bit crazy that is. <laughs> and two, the power of getting the right help in the right areas of our business, especially when it comes to simplifying. Like that just feels good to think about versus layering on and doing more, right? So I think, I think it's been very helpful. All right. Well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my website. Uh, okay. Like should be all the links, uh, whether awesome. you're looking for one big expensive project or some much, much more affordable coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but I mean, I think it, it might sound like I only work with big businesses and yes, most of them are to, like multi six to multi seven figure businesses, but mm -hmm. I even work with people who are just getting into business and haven't made even their first sale. Oh, nice. but I try not to price myself out of it because I really like working with people mm. like that, assuming they are dedicated to it. Right. So if someone's just thinking of doing it as a hobby and like, and I don't mean that they need to be like workaholics. That's not at all what I go for, but rather that if someone's not really like in it, Committed. they don't really yep. want to do it, then I'm I'm not the right person to help. Yeah. But yeah. it's, yeah. No, nope, understood. Yeah, uh, happy to, if someone has a question, they can send me an email, contact at petersandine.com. Um, love it awesome well, Peter... a couple of days to get a get a reply but i, I will <laughs> reply right i know i joke with my va my i mean my tech guy that some emails you know they takes a couple times around the world and they stop in france and have a glass of wine and then we can get to them <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good to train our people to not expect an immediate response um well peter it's been so fun to talk with you and connect with you again i really appreciate you being so generous with your time what final thought would you like to leave people with today um well this doesn't apply to everyone i admit mm. that but i think if business isn't fun you're doing it wrong mm. so i mean Yes, some people do their business as just this game of how much money they can make and it might not be very fun. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I, at least I try to approach it as like, if you're more stressed than anything positive, then something is wrong and you mm. should do something about it, whether it is getting a coach to help with it or just something else. Uh, but it, it, it shouldn't, it doesn't need to be like that. It, it can be a fairly not necessarily relaxing thing in the beginning, oh. especially if you're really like struggling to get going, but it, yeah. it's not supposed to be this end, like endless grind. Right. Yes. It should at some point be enjoyable, right? Yeah. And yeah. fairly early. It, yeah. it, it should get to that point fairly quickly. Not, mm. I mean, I can't say it's this many months for everyone, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't take a massive amount of time. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's such an important reminder. Peter, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's, it's always fun to talk with you.